Okay, uh, t- this morning we are in Genesis chapter 20. Uh, Genesis, we're in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26. I've got Genesis on my mind because I'm going to ask you to set a tab, uh, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3 because I've got a text that's going to supplement our study this morning uh, from Genesis chapter 3. And we are in Proverbs chapter 26, and we are beginning this morning in verse 8. Now, as I've told you before, we're not going any longer verse by verse through the book of Proverbs because we have covered so many of them. Uh, We're not going to be redundant. We have a section in here, uh, verses 13 through 16, that deals with the sluggard, the lazy, man that we have no appreciation for because of his indolence. And we're going to skip that section because we've pretty much dealt with the sluggard in the past, and this offers really nothing new. What you do have from this point forward is going to be what I consider to be uh, hand-selected by me uh, proverbs that I find very difficult They're very difficult to translate, and they're very difficult to understand. And so uh, that's why we're going to address them. Uh, I want to pay particular attention to the small words this morning. Um, The ands, the ifs, the buts, those are intricate in understanding the proverb, and they're different in the various and sundry translations that you have. So I'm going to point out uh, what I believe to be the easy way to read and understand the text by referencing those small, intricate, little, what you call particles from the Hebrew text. Okay, here is our Proverbs this morning. Uh, Proverbs 26, beginning in verse 8. The one who binds a stone in a sling is a person who gives honor to a fool. 9. A thorn bush in the hand of a drunkard and the proverb are a teaching instruction in the mouth of a fool. Uh, Obviously, you've got somewhat of a contradiction in terms right there. A proverb would be uh, someone who uh, understands the inspiration and authority of the Scriptures and would call uh, an inspired uh, saying a proverb. Uh, This, it's translated proverb, but it's much more in line with something very secular not implied from a, uh, a believer. And thus you have this behavior, the drunkard who is a fool, who's living a life of folly. Uh, we skip 10 and we go to 11. And the reason I picked this, uh, although it's rather straightforward, is because Peter uh, quotes it in the New Testament. And so I thought that would be Uh, very relevant to us. So, as a dog returns to its own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And again, folly is the life of uh, unaccountability to God. It's a display of that life, if you will. Uh, Twelve, Do you see a person wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. We skip the sluggard, verses 13 through 16, and pick it up in verse 18 and 19, which are joined together by one of those little small particles. You probably have it translated so, or and, in your text. So they're tied together. Like a maniac who shoots flaming arrows, 
so is the man who deceives his neighbor and said, I was only joking. And finally, we do 24 with his lips. An enemy dissembles, or you may have in your text, disguises, and his inner being, he is about deception. So that is really his heart, or that's the insight. It's being deceptive. We really finish uh, the last two Proverbs with this idea of deception, and I want to look at it from two different perspectives. All right, let's begin with verse 8, like one who binds a stone. Now, if there was ever a relevant proverb that we've ever studied together, this is very relevant. That's what we're all about, isn't it? I mean, this is our America. We're honoring fools. We honor them all the time, giving out titles. We recognize the worst of people, handing out trophies, pinning badges, ribbons around their neck. And they're fools, and they've lived horrible lives, but we honor them. Well, that's what this proverb is about. This very top line is very difficult to translate. It's a proverb that makes fun of honoring a fool. This opening, notice the word like, it, that's a comparison. So we're comparing the honoring of the fool to tying a stone in a sling. Of course, we all know the sling is not bound. Uh, it would be ineffective. So what is the sling that he would be talking about? Well, it's two long strips of leather and then in the middle, stitched together, you have the large area, the pouch, and that's where you put the rock in, that would be the projectile, and then the warrior would take it overhead and with centrifugal force, faster and faster, and then with the dexterity of what we can imagine the grip of his hand and the release of his fingers. He knows how to do that and the projectile goes in one straight with centrifugal force direction and it becomes deadly. Ask Goliath, he will tell you. And uh, so that's the the idea that we're, we have here. It's this um, it's this weapon, and to actually stitch this pouch together, now your rock has no way to release itself. And so, try all you will with your hand, and whatever that is, involves, the hand, the wrist, the fingers, it's of no effect because the projectile can't get out of the pouch. That's the joke. It's different than Johnny Carson jokes, but that's the joke of the book of Proverbs. And uh, to bind the leather pouch makes the weapon to no effect whatsoever. So giving honor to a fool. That's the point. That's the like at the beginning of the proverb. You want to honor a fool? Okay. Well, it, first of all, has no effect. I look at it and I say, well, there's another fool being honored. Uh, you look at it and say that probably something similar. Doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it's as ridiculous as tying a weapon together so that the weapon is ineffective. That's what you have in the proverb. It doesn't work, it looks ridiculous, and it's ineffective. But here is the instruction for all of us. It is a part of our faith, Romans chapter 13, that we do give honor to whom honor 
is due. And that is our testimony. We honor people by what they have done, what they stand for, and it is a testimony about ourselves. We don't look foolish. We don't look ineffective when we do those things. And we should be about honoring people whom honor is due, and we should do it quite often. Here's verse 9. A thorn bush in the hand of a drunkard. The King James translates this word in as going up into, like a thistle that would puncture the outer layer of the skin and then drive into different layers beneath the dermis. That's the idea and the way it's translated in the King James. The basic idea about this thorn bush is it's passive. It's a thorn bush. It, it is the one who directs it, moves it. That is the reference point to the proverb. Now the reason that I bring that up is because to me, the thorn bush is pretty much like a weapon, uh, a gun, if you will. Now, I'm no advocate of guns. I don't belong to a gun club. I don't have a badge, uh, uh, and nor do I even have a weapon. But it seems to me it's one and the same. For example, uh, guns don't assemble themselves. Guns don't load themselves. Uh, guns don't point themselves, and guns don't squeeze the trigger by themselves. It's all directed by a person, and that's what you have here. And who is the person? Well, he's a drunk, and he has taken a common thorn bush, and he's made it into a weapon. See, the word thorn bush occurs 11 times in the Old Testament. It's translated brambles, thorns, thistles all came as a result of sin from the garden, but they're passive. That's the idea. And that's why this very important and at the end of line one, I hope you have and, because you may have is or so is, it ties the comparison together in the proverb. The staggering drunkard who symbolizes corruption, dereliction of duty, a life of folly. It's used of Nabal, the fool. Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, verse 36, she saves the day. She saves the farm, the ranch. She saves everyone's lives by appeasing David, only to come home and find her husband, and here's the word, drunk. So the proverb is teaching that in the mouth of a fool, you have this teaching. It wounds, it lacerates others, and that's the way it's compared. Proverbs 12, 18, rash words are like a sword's thrust. They hurt, they kill, they maim. The skill for living Wisdom that we're studying here puts a great deal of emphasis on communication. I've tried to stress that to you. How you talk to one another, how we speak to one another, it's a part of wisdom. It is the skill that God would have us to use one with another. So I ask this question. How do you want to be remembered? What do people think of you when they hear your name mentioned? Well, they don't think in terms of necessarily your face because your face will be forgotten. What you wear will be forgotten. But what you say, when you said it, how you said it, the time, the setting, the providence, the place, that will be remembered. I remember he said to me, she said to me, and it was 
so meaningful at that particular time in my life or it was so hateful. That's what people remember. How do you want to be remembered? The Proverbs instruct us to choose our tongue with wisdom. That's how you want to be remembered. As we all know, people remember you for what you say, when you said it, and how you said it. So here's 11. A proverb we all know. Uh, but a proverb that obviously made quite an impression upon Peter because he quotes it. 2 Peter 2.22 In the Old Testament, dogs were not attractive. And they had behaviors and lives that were ravaged with disease and they were to be avoided. Um, David, Psalm 22, verse 16, he calls evildoers dogs. One and the same in his mind, dogs surround me, a company of evildoers. See, they're one and the same. Encircle me. That's the way he thought of dogs. I was watching a dog show from New Jersey over Christmas. Now, that's how languishing my Christmas was this year. I'm watching a dog show. And, uh, but they were outdoors. And it began to rain, not heavy rain, just a light mist. And they would run the dogs around the circle and the, the judge would point and here and there. And then they emphasized that once they got them into a certain order, that they would come back and be moved under the tent in the afternoon to be judged. And the announcer said, what a busy day for these handlers because once you do this little parade in the morning, you're going to have to come back in the afternoon and do something very similar. And the dog needs to be completely clean. So here you go. Wash them again. Dry them again. Well, that's not this dog. That's not the Old Testament dog. He's not all fluffed up and hair waving in the wind and we all applaud. No, this is different in David's mind. Look, as a dog and the connective at the end of that line, so or is, solidifies the dog's comparison here to the fool. They are, in fact, connected by their disgusting and revolting behavior. The repulsive nature of the wild cur is the idea. He returns to his own vomit. One and the same as the fool who repeats or returns to his own folly. Which, as we have discussed often, is a life without accountability to God whatsoever. Fools are a mess. They're a train wreck. Uh, they look great on the outside. Their appearance is often lovely. And they seem to have it all together. But their lives are a train wreck. They are a road grader going down Central Expressway at 5 o'clock at 90 miles an hour. And anyone that's in their way uh, feels the blunt force of their lifestyle. In both instances, both behaviors are repulsive. That's the idea. Proverbs teaches us very clearly avoid the fool. And so 2 Peter 2.22, the apostle uses false teachers by referencing them to the proverb. They, in fact, who is a false teacher? He has a hidden life. He has a life that you don't see. It all looks good on the surface. But then we discover... He's quite a bit different than the way he projects himself, the way we know him to be publicly. So how do we know the difference? Well, we listen to his voice and we compare his behavior to his voice. Is it one and the same? It takes a while to find that out. Everybody looks good at the first appearance like the dog in the show. But that dog, leave him long and he'll be dirty. 
So they return to their old lifestyle. May not see it, but they eventually get there. And that's the fool. So we listen to them, and then we watch them. Is it consistent? Is it one and the same? The Proverbs say, seeing eyes, listening ears, the Lord has made them both. Mr. Spurgeon said, you can learn a lot in a little. So just watch them and listen to them. Do you see a divergence? If so, you're dealing with a fool. Here's 12. You see a person who is wise in his own eyes. There's more hope for a fool than for him. Let's realize that the Proverbs have constantly been teaching us that the skill for living, that's wisdom, the word skill. Skill for living comes from God and God only. Now, we are out in the public and we say, well, you know, that was very wise of him. Uh, that was very wise. That was very good. Just little shards of what we would call wisdom. Maybe they forgave this or they returned that. Good deeds. And it, it, it's impressive. But that's not the skill for living. Just because we see these little shards out here, little flashes, that is not what the proverb is teaching. The proverbs are teaching us that wisdom, the skill for living, comes from God and God alone. Not morality from our society. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Not words taught by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit. And instruction that is antithetical to our nature. Now, that's from God, not from men. So, it's the ultimate hubris for a man to think that he is wise. He's not. What does the book teach? Humility, righteousness. Those are the qualities of life that wisdom produces. That's the skill for living. So our top line opens with a question. Do you see a person? Now why that should captivate our attention is we saw that very opening earlier in the book of Proverbs, and it's rather riveting. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a talented person in their work? That was the question, the opening. In life, we, contact, we come into contact with, with others, and we see their talent, and we observe it, and we applaud it, we pay for it, and it is valuable. We deem it to be valuable. The person in line one is the fool here in line two. He's really lower than a fool, if that's possible. Why do I say that? Because the Proverbs crack the door open ever so slightly for the fool. For example, Proverbs 17:28. Even a fool is thought to be wise if he keeps his mouth shut. Interesting. But here, he is wise in his own eyes. So there's absolutely no hope whatsoever for him. So what's worse than a fool? Answer, a deluded fool thinking himself to be what he is not. We often listen to him, and we come away and say, boy, that guy is really full of himself. Well, that's the idea. He has ability, he has talent, but he is a captive to his own mind. Now, we see this all the time. Let me help you think through, because we want to differentiate between talent and the skill for living. Talent, we look up on the silver screen or we look up on the stage and we say, ah, that, that actor, that actress, 
I could just follow them in every role that they play. They're so genuine. Uh, I just really enjoy that person and the way they act out. Uh, they, they pick up an instrument and they can play it. And we, we pay money for that. that that's excellence. Uh, we do that with our athletes. We want them out on that golf course making those miraculous shots. Did you see that shot he just made? Um, last Sunday, I leapt out of my chair watching my Dallas Cowboys. Um, <laughs> C.D. Lamb, he's, he's being interfered with by being pushed in the back. The ball is overthrown over his left shoulder. He bends, his, contorts his body around. He makes the catch even though a man interfered with him. And he's running full speed. And I say, that's talent. That's talent. That's not the skill for living. We confuse them. Do you see a talented man in his work? Do you see a person who has talent? It's not the skill for living. It's not. And we see it all the time. Here is what the book of Proverbs offers to you. 22.4 Humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Real living. Real understanding of life. Where it comes from. And the admonition from Proverbs 3.7 Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. What is wisdom? It's righteousness. It's not talent. Here's what happens to our talented ones. They get out. They cross the chalk. Or they leave the golf course. They exit the stage. And they come out. And they live among us. And then the next thing you know, we cringe. We close our eyes. They did what? They did what? Well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Because they have no skill for living. They don't have what this book is teaching, you and me. Everything we thought about them comes through their performance. They play on their talent. But that's not living. And that's not this skill that this book is teaching. Don't be wise in your own eyes. This man has no hope. He is a mocker. Because he lives on his talent, he thinks he is something wise. And he's not. He's a fool. Here's 18. We open with like, another comparison. And boy, how relevant this is. Did you see the pictures from Atlanta, Georgia? Setting a police car on fire, breaking windows, rocks through windows, downtown Atlanta. Well, what does the proverb say to that? They call that person a maniac. He shoots flaming arrows. In this case, it was rocks. Firebrands, your text might read. Final words describe it as deadly arrows. A very visual picture of a deranged person. That's what Proverbs think. Making mischief, mischief by randomly starting fires and with deliberate designs to destruct and destroy. That's your arrows of death. And it's tied to, look, verse 19. You see that so? That's the tie-in. That's the man who desires his neighbor or deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Notice it's a neighbor, it's not a friend. What do we know about neighbors from Proverbs? They're the man on the street. They're third parties. This is no friend. It's a, he deals in treachery. He deals with a deliberate 
purpose to deceive and mislead. When I looked at this proverb, I immediately thought back to the deception of Jacob. That's Genesis 29, 25. What a deceiver Laban was. He, Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, the love of his life, only to wake up the next morning and there's Leah. That's called deception. The text reads, Behold Leah. So, it's deception that harms another by word or by deed. That's what Laban did to this man. All with the intent and the purpose to get another seven years out of him, so he gave him the other daughter, Rachel, at the time. Have you been deceived? I've been deceived. I was deceived big time back in 2007 in a business transaction. People lied and misrepresented to me, and so I first thing took my business partners out of the transaction and so that they had no liability and they had no cost. And then I took this on myself. It was for the purpose to deceive me. What carried me through that deception is Jacob. I began to contemplate Jacob and the deception that was pulled on him. And I learned something. So if you have been deceived and deliberately deceived, learn something valuable from Jacob. What did he do with that deception? He lived with it. He lived under it. Stay under your trials. Even though they are meant for evil, with evil intent, God will work a mighty work in your life. Look, here's what you learn. Leah turns out to be a great blessing in Jacob's life. Look at the sons that she had. Now, make no mistake, Rachel was the love of his life, and he brings that back up later to Joseph. But Leah was a great blessing. And when did Rachel die? She gave birth to Benjamin, and she dies on the road to Ephrath. And when Jacob is ready to die and pull up his feet in his bed, what does he say? Go bury me next to my beloved Rachel? No, he says, bury me at Machpelah, where Abraham and Isaac are buried. And guess who's buried there too? Leah. I know why Jacob said that. Because it was a testimony in his death. This was the land that they purchased. But I also see that that is God honoring. And God honored that dear woman, Leah, in his life. My friends, you've been deceived. You've been taken advantage of. You've been lied to, lied about, misrepresented. Stay under the trial. Stay under it. And God will bring a blessing out of it that you would not have had otherwise. Now, you see that little connective and? It ties the illustration of the flaming arrows being shot of verse 18 to the description of treachery in verse 19 together. And it comes in the form of a question. Translated this way, the King James translated, I, was I not joking? See, that's the cover of deception. He sloughs it off. Make no mistake. That is harming his neighbor, harming a third party. And that's not a joke. It's evil. And it's the practice of cruelty. Another proverb to remind us that wisdom is a black and white world, never gray. 
My friends, God will see to it in life that you and I are hurt by people. But it is God's blessing for you to wait and see it in perspective. That's what Joseph did to his brothers. Remember, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. But how many years and decades later before he ever uttered those words? See, that's perspective. God's making a masterpiece out of you. And it takes time for the image of Christ to be seen and appreciated. Here's our last proverb. 24 with his lips, an enemy dissembles, disguises. Well, that's an interesting word. And his inner being, he harbors deception. Very, very difficult proverb. Because what you have here is you have two views of the fool. Now look at that proverb closely. Do you see that? There is uh, an outward view of him. That's him talking. That's what you see. His lips are speaking. But then we have another camera, and that's on the inside. Right here in the proverb. Where he harbors, or where he lays up his deceit. So we're actually getting two views of this man. We open the top line with the outward projections. It's all smiles. The seeming sincere tongue. His lips are speaking. And it all sounds so great. But his activity is actually to deceive. Your translation here may have disguise. Now this is a wonderful word. I'm going to give you a word picture here. Genesis 42.7. Here's the word. Uh, Joseph saw his brothers. He recognized them. Your NIV says they're pretended. New American Standard disguised. Really, the King James has the best translation. Um, the King James says they were foreign or foreigners. That's the idea of the word. Joseph saw his brothers coming into sophisticated Egypt and being there in all the refinery and gold of Egypt, and they looked like they looked like they were out of place. Foreigners. That's the idea of the word. That's why they didn't recognize him. Now, line two, you see that and? The NIV and the New American Standard have a contrast. So if that's your translation, you have a but. But in actuality, I think the and is better than the contrast because line two is really a continuation of the same thought of the same person. It's just a different view and a different perspective. So line one, you have the outward. Line two, the inward of the same man. And so the and is more clear. Heart is the organs of the, utter, of the upper torso. That's the idea. And, uh, and it's used that way in the Old Testament. The idea here is he harbors, he lays up, that's your King James, deception. It's part of what he's doing and the way he's thinking about it. Now, real quickly... Genesis 3. I want to show you something. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1, I want to show you deception. 3 1, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall we touch it, lest we die. Now look at the contrast here. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God 
knows. Now, that's your word, knows. Why is that so riveting? Because you have the enemy of your soul and my soul now teaching the woman the Word of God. And it's not the Word of God. Pulpits all over this land are loaded with His disciples, the serpent. And they are interpreting the Word of God to the man and to the woman that sits in the pew. But it's not the pure Word of God. It's Emil Brunner's 1960 demythologizing. See, it's uh, Mark's taking us through the miracles of Luke, and the Lord is healing the blind man, He's healing the withered hand, and He's doing these miraculous acts. And Boltman says, and Emil Brunner, they said, well, it's really not, uh, it's not actually a miracle. Because miracles don't really happen in a natural world. But we have to demythologize the text, meaning we've got to look underneath and find the real story. What's the real story here? It's not a person that actually was blind and now they see. We're actually crippled, but now they walk. No, that's not really what's happening. It's some hidden meaning. So people pile into churches and they listen, wanting to hear the Word of God, and what do they get? They get nothing. They get nothing. And they walk out, and they shake His hand and say, thank you for that. And I'm wondering, what did I get out of that? You got nothing. Because it's demythologizing the Word of God. You thank God for the men that preserve the teaching of the Word of God in this place, the elders and the deacons. They are teaching you the truth. Pray for them. And they are seeing that what you are receiving is the actual Word of God. The evil intent of people. It's chilling. And that's what you have here. That is the deceiver. That is the deceptive person. And they are enemies to your soul. Pray that God would protect us by protecting these men first. Our first line of defense. That what we have here is the clear instruction from the Word of God and not any impurity that comes from the outside in. Now, that's our proverb. Let's close in prayer. Thank You, Father, for a time of study today. Thank You for the, the joy and the opportunity to study the Word of God together. Bless Your Word into the hearts and minds of Your people that they would be skilled for living, wise for living, and that they would be made powerful in living before you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.